Well, Harris is going to be in Texas, in Houston, campaigning with, oh my gosh, who is it? I can never remember this dude's name. He's challenging Tom Cruise. Not Tom Cruise! <laughs> Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz. I think that our country is right now in the most dangerous position it's ever been. confident that there will be a peaceful transfer of power in January 2025. If Trump wins, no, I'm not confident. Take a look at what happened. You're considered the most liberal United States senator. I, I Somebody said that. Campaign rally is not a press conference. Why hasn't she had a press conference? She's the vice president. She can handle the questions. Why not do it? Dana, I think the most important and most significant aspect of my policy perspective and decisions is my values have not changed. Four months from now, we will have an incredible victory, and we will begin the four greatest years in the history of our country. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Campaign Games, the game of survival for the candidates and the voters. I can't speak. It's too early in the morning. I'm exhausted. I did not go to bed at appropriate time last night. It's 11 days until the election of the century. I'm like, I'm going to drag myself across this finish line. If, if <laughs> We are. We are going to do this. It's going to be okay. <laughs> We're going to live through this. We're going to make I like it, here. it I like it that we think that on November 6th, life will go back to normal. Oh, I absolutely. <laughs> it was just hilarious. I have no, I'm just trying to speak positive. <laughs> yes. So today we're going to talk about Harris's town hall and how it's completely changing the game and winning her this election without a doubt. <laughs> I love it that you couldn't even say Harris's town hall without laughing because that's how well, that's what it was laughable. It was pretty much a I. It was we so, laughed to keep from crying that that this woman could possibly become that You safe. traitor. You fell asleep. I did. <laughs> I did. I did. And what is so sad is my husband is usually the one that's snoring next to me when I'm watching these things. And I fell asleep and he stayed awake and was trying to wake me up during it. He said at one point, about 25 minutes in, he got kind of mad because he's like, dang it, usually I'm asleep. And now I've started watching it and I'm not only awake, but I'm mad. And... <laughs> He tried to wake me You're up at one me point. Suffer alone. And he goes, Do you want to wake up and watch any of this? And he, I just was like, No, I'm so tired. Jet lag was killing me. I'm on the mend. But yeah, I totally ditched you. I apologize. I, I ditched you and the community on Instagram that I promised I would actually cover it for. So sorry. <laughs> that was a fail. Well, yeah, so it was. But before we get into this episode, to do the thing, as in give us a five-star rating, leave us a comment, share it with a friend, all of the stuff. Just give us some love because it really helps us spread the word, spread mm -hmm. the love, educate people on the true <laughs> facts of what this campaign is. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So let's talk about this town hall. Uh, okay. If we must. Well, <laughs> first of all, this was supposed to be set up for a debate. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it like it was supposed to be or it was offered as a debate to Trump and Harris and but Trump, Trump turned like, it. Yeah. No. Like, no. And why would he? I mean, come on. Seriously. It's like, OK, so side note, first thing, even before we get started with the episode, she's doing this whole talking point about he's tired. He's canceling. <laughs> he's not doing this. He's not doing that. It shows that he just doesn't have the stand. And I'm like, okay, first of all, you covered for your boss for like, I don't even know how long. So it's such a faith hole. Like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you have no credibility. Right. Okay. So let's do that. Let's point that out. But also, I feel like Trump has almost instituted harris's initial strategy of i don't want to say vibes because obviously they're out there actually promoting i don't know actual policy mm -hmm. but he's like i'm doing good i'm gonna well, go keep talking to people and getting my message out who's not gonna filter me who's not gonna give me a hard time mm -hmm. and i'm gonna i'm gonna just kind of coast into the home stretch yeah i, I think i don't think coast I, is fair but you know what i mean no the difference is, I think there's definitely a vibe. If we're going to use that word, let's use it because they used it. The Democrat machine and the Harris campaign specifically used it for, what, like two straight months. It's all about vibes, brat summer. The difference is that the vibes that Donald Trump is giving off, that his campaign is giving off, are authentic. They're yeah, not they're fabricated. Legit. Like everybody's, I mean, not everybody. Democrats hate him and wish he would disappear. But People 
are energized by his campaign. They enjoy the rallies. They are having fun. He's having a good time. He's doing like random kind of funny off the cuff appearances. And we'll talk about later calls into rallies or into interviews, whatever. He seems to be having a nice time doing this and he's yeah. really enjoying himself. Whereas Harris, it was all fabricated. It wasn't genuine. It was just it was super like, scripted. It was forced. Stylized. It was like, we all are having the best time of our lives. We're all loving this. And so, yeah, she's, I think she's jealous. She is, <laughs> she is watching this guy surge in the polls. And anybody who tells you that he is not up is no. drunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she's watching and she's jealous. He's having a good time and people are having a good time. And clearly he's doing something right. And so I think she, like the Hitler narrative, is just saying stuff now. And everybody knows that Trump is not tired and he's not canceling stuff. What is he canceling? He's at everything. He's well, doing I mean, multiple he, things a day. He's canceling things that she wants him to do. The scene like what? Town hall. She doesn't want him to do that. She's so happy he canceled that. Come on. <laughs> Interviews with like yeah. legacy media, like I the 60 Minutes thing. But I'm like, okay, fine, maybe, not that I believe it, of you saying that he's dodging. There, there's more legitimacy to that, even though it's and bogus. He's, then he's then tired. He's, tired. he's not tired. He's, not, he's tired. not tired. You know who looked tired? You know who looked tired and <laughs> wanted to dodge and like Her crawl boss. under a rock? <laughs> Joe Biden. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> but specifically Harris at the town hall with Anderson yeah, Cooper. That like, did not go well for her. Well, bro, it was amazing to me because, first of all, it opens, right? Because we've just had to to set the stage. You know, if you were here for our unfiltered, unedited episode, this is literally the same day that she did her presser mm -hmm. about how Trump essentially loves Hitler or whatever, mm -hmm. according to John Kelly, which right. is... You already know our feelings about that, right? So she does that that afternoon. She is preparing for this town hall, okay? Let me put mm -hmm. an emphasis on this. She took the day off from campaigning to prepare for this town hall. I would say that she did not get sufficient ROI on that, okay? There was no <laughs> return on investment to, no, take, there was to use her words. Mm -mm. She did not campaign. She did not hit the stump. Instead, she stayed at her house, had this horrible presser that, for the most part, did not go over well, and then did a horrible town hall. So she was just having a really bad day. Yeah, it was one of those things, like if Trump had had back-to-back -back wildly unsuccessful public appearances, oh, I can everywhere. only imagine what the legacy media would be doing. They would just, it, they'd be throwing a party. Absolutely. Balloons, confetti, the election's over, it's Kamala's to lose. And yet she does two really just not well thought out, not prepared for <laughs> appearances. And still somehow I'm watching the news and they're still like people are treating Kamala unfairly. Maybe she just didn't have a good night there. It's because she's a woman. I'm like, gosh, you guys, <laughs> when are you going to stop defending her? She is just a very bad candidate. She she's is just not good at this. Really bad. And it yep. opened, well, it, it opened with, Cooper asking her about this story about yep. Trump supporting or not supporting. I don't want to say supporting, but the allegations that he admires Hitler or something. And like she that. doubled down. She yep, totally did. It. I'm, I'm going to say it again. She did a long speech. Just just really. I don't even know how to. It's just so visceral. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And she just comes off as and it's so funny to me because she's so desperate to be like, we have to turn the page. Unity. But my opponent is literally Hitler. And if you support him, you're kind of a little Hitler, too. That's yeah. what people are hearing, which is why right. it's not resonating. And then right. he flat out asked her, do you think Trump is a fascist? And she said, yes, I do. You've quoted General Milley calling Donald Trump a, a fascist. You yourself have not used that word to describe him. Let me ask you tonight. Do you think Donald Trump is a fascist? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I mean, OK. How is there no internal discussion about how she needs to tamp down the rhetoric? It, truly. I mean, are they that tone deaf? People do not like this. I don't even think Democrats like this. Do they're not loving think... the Hitler situation. Or they're sabotaging her. Someone is. 
But do you think her team, whoever's on her team advising her, because mm-hmm. let's point, like, she has Obama people on her team. Do I don't even th- think Obama likes this. Because guess what? She's going to lose. And Obama doesn't want this to be the last vestige of President Barack Obama in the public eye. He doesn't want to be attached to that. I don't think he likes this either. I want to know who her staff is. I bet you it's just a bunch of young 20-somethings who have been so indoctrinated that Donald Trump is the most evil ogre that's ever run for I don't know office. because she has some smart people on that team. Like I said, well, she has does she life though? that she's uncontrollable. Well, that's honestly. what my question is. Is it her team that's poorly advising her or is her? Is it she? Is it that she's unwilling to take their advice? That's a good question, because if it is her team that's advising her to run this campaign into the ground the way she's doing right now, then they are not smart. I don't care who they work for, because this is not going well for her. This Hitler stuff. I I just don't think this is going to this is not the way they want to end the campaign. This is not what they want the last kind of memory of her campaign to be. This yeah. is in the home stretch. This is what you're going to do. Come on. Yeah. Well, that is definitely her strategy because throughout <laughs> the entire town hall, not only was she giving word salads and circular mm-hmm. answers, mm-hmm. she would then, of course, pivot to Trump and how yeah. horrible Trump was. Uh, and he's the worst. Yep. And it was literally the same talking point. Like I have gotten to the point, like I'm watching her so much because mm-hmm. I don't know, because I'm a masochist. No, because this is our job. <laughs> Take yourself seriously. But it is a little... It's, we're gluttons for punishment. But I am starting a game on my mm-hmm. own where when I watch her, I can anticipate what she's yeah, going to Yeah, you know say. her answers. Yes. Oh, it's, yeah. It's absolutely wild. And then- It's not hard to win that game, honestly. I will say this about the town hall is that even though Anderson Cooper had moments where he was trying to serve her a layup and hold mm-hmm. her hand, he also had moments where he knocked her back off her and she- like off her feet like she Mm -hmm. almost like the rug was pulled out from under her yeah and she did not know how to answer and those were some of the most golden (laughs) sound bites you could ever ask for yep absolutely the question okay i just this one i saw it live it's funny how much pleasure you derive from this (laughs) if the listener could see your face and how giddy you are (laughs) At her stumbling and fumbling, we should not be that excited about it. But truly, it was just, I mean, I was just so blown back because I'm watching this live, and it's when she's asked about by an audience member about her weaknesses, right? What do you consider a weakness? And it's one of these classic questions that you get during an interview. Yeah. What are your positives and what are your negatives? My negative is that I work too hard and I'm exactly. much too dedicated. <laughs> Gosh, and. It's, it was literally, that's how it came off. I could not believe this is how she responded. And I need everybody to listen to this because <laughs> it was gold. Was it this one? I just want to make sure because there's literally two clips. So there is there's the a one. Lot. There's a lot of content that we yeah, could because, be going with. So let me just set the stage for you. So she's asked the question by an audience member. She answers the question. And then I also want to play the follow-up from Cooper because I think that one is almost better. Mm-hmm. But you have to hear them together to get the whole picture of just how bad she is. <laughs> There's really no other way to put it. That's a great question, Joe. Um, well, I am certainly not perfect. <laughs> so let's start there. And um, I think that I perhaps a weakness, some would say, but I actually think it's a strength is I really do value having a team of very smart people around me who bring to my decision-making process different perspectives. I, um, my team will tell you, I am constantly saying, let's kick the tire on that. Let's kick the tire. First of all, she didn't even answer the question and she managed to take the question and make it all about how, I don't know, great she is for having smart people that she works with that's like what it's so bizarre right so she doesn't answer the question obviously yeah that's normal as we as it was evidenced by that yeah. horrible response and so cooper is like okay how about <laughs> let's get a clarification on this right yeah and this is how that one goes 
Is, is there something you can point to in your life, political life or in your life in the last four years, that you think is a mistake that you have learned from? I mean, I've, I, I've made many mistakes. Um, and they range from, you know, <laughs> if you've ever parented a child, you know you make lots of mistakes, too. Um, in my role as vice president, I mean, I've probably worked very hard at making sure that um, I am well versed on issues and um, I think that is very important. It's a mistake not to be well versed on an issue and feel compelled to answer a question. What? I mean, why can't you just say something that is a weakness of yours? I can come up with like 20 that I have right now on the spot easily. Are they so afraid to expose any weakness? Is that it? Or does she really not well, even know and herself think... well enough to know what she struggles with. I don't know. No, I think, and that was like one of her trends on this town hall was the fact that she is just not willing to concede anything, th anything <laughs> that she's done wrong. So even later, there was a question about whether or not about the border. Like he mm -hmm. actually kind of really got in on her about the border. Mm -hmm. And at one point, He's like, well, don't, did you make any mistakes or did you, do you regret it or anything like that? And she just would not relent. And what's crazy to me, and we'll play that clip here because the border exchange to me was like pretty wild. Yeah. Because one of the problems that she is having is her absolute refusal to separate herself from Biden, to mm -hmm. criticize him. And I guess you can say that's loyalty or whatever. Well, not really, though, because at the same exact time, she is saying that she is going to come and turn the page and fix the problems with America that she directly contributed to by being part of the Biden-Harris ticket. So she's, on one hand, not willing to say anything, like, vocally, verbally about him, but she is smashing him all the time by saying that she's going to fix this horrible problem that we're in that is kind of of her own making. So it's really weird. Yeah. And instead of just she could take some ownership for it yeah. and be like, yeah, maybe we should have uh, done something different or the strategy because obviously it affected people. And you could take advantage and diplomatically mm -hmm. humble yourself and be like, but I'm going to try and do better. That is my promise. I think a and lot I, of people would actually respond to that. Yeah. And I learned my lessons. And mm -hmm. now I promise you that I will do better. And that's how my president and, and you can even say it in a way that like. Biden did what he believed was best. And sometimes yeah. you make mistakes and sometimes yeah, and you have to work. make changes. Yeah. Like yep. it, just because you go after him or criticize what he's done, it's not a direct attack on him. And even if it is, like he's ever going to talk to her again. Like, let's be honest. <laughs> he is done with all of those people. He is he is not having it. So, so I need to play this because he is challenging her on not just the horrible border policies, but the fact that they <laughs> got rid of all of these executive orders. And then it was it's like common sense questions. If you're going to manage things appropriately, maybe these are the sort of things you can consider. And you guys have to see because she gets so uncomfortable right. in this question. Her face goes sour. She starts to like stand away from Cooper. Like she wants to run off that stage. Yeah. And she's angry, too. Like, <laughs> you can pick that up. Like, just very mad. Yeah. She is absolutely ticked about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it is wild to watch. Let's let's listen to her real quick. 2022, 2023, sure. there were record border crossings. You, your administration took a number, hundreds of executive actions. It didn't stem the flow. Numbers kept going up. Finally, in 2024... Uh, just in June, three weeks before the last the first presidential debate with Joe Biden, uh, you institute executive actions that had a dramatic impact, really shut down people crossing over. Why didn't your administration do that in 2022, 2023? 
First of all, you're exactly right, Anderson. And as of today, we have cut the flow of immigration by over half. In fact, the numbers I saw most recently, mm -hmm. illegal immigration. But if is it was low that easy on, with that finish. executive me, action, why not do it in 2022, well, 2023? Because we were working with Congress and hoping that actually we could have a long-term fix to the problem instead of a short-term fix. You couldn't have done one and the, both at the same time? Well, here's the thing. I, we have to understand that ultimately this problem is going to be fixed through congressional action. I oh. mean, yikes. This is like common, just general management. It's okay. What you should have done, mm -hmm. maybe, is left the border closed and then try to pass some legislation. I mean, maybe Anderson Cooper should be the Democrat nominee because he's doing better than she is. <laughs> so. I mean, he definitely has better ideas than they ever mm -hmm. did. I mean, for goodness sake. Or he and just then, knows how to answer a question. I don't know. Well, I don't know. It's just like common sense. And then they get all upset. And they, as in the Democrats, they get upset because you'll speculate that this that they're doing it because they're trying to fill the country with democrat voters and then yeah. they'll accuse you of the great replacement theory and call mm. you a right that sort of thing right but then you do stuff like this and it's like is are people really crazy to be thinking mm -hmm. what you're doing is strategic yeah and like that it, or it, that it's going to make a lick of difference it, you're acting like you can do nothing like your hands are tied there are things you can do. And Anderson Cooper said, it's not just, yes, Congress plays an enormous role in this, obviously. But there's short-term and long-term fixes. And and even if your ideas are bad, just have some. Have an idea. Have anything that you can offer the American people who are genuinely and rightfully concerned about this border crisis. And that is exactly what it is. This is a crisis. And she has no answers. None. Well, Zero. And it was, it was wild because... Later in this, she kind of gets pushed about her feelings on it. Yeah. And <laughs> the her response, instead of just, like we said, taking, I don't know, taking the knee, like taking mm -hmm. the loss, yeah. so to speak, she admits, and she, or doesn't admit, she argues that they did the right thing, which to me is... Yeah, that's just so much... That is so manipulative and irresponsible. You have to hear her for her own words because it is just, to me, I was shocked when she said this. You've done those executive orders in 2022, 2023. I think we did the right thing. and But the, the best thing that can happen for the American people is that we have bipartisan work happening. And I pledge to you that I will work across the aisle to fix this long-standing problem. I think the American people are demanding it yeah. on both sides of the aisle, and it's time we actually put the partisan approach to this aside. We know what can... So if you missed that first part because I clicked in too fast, he's asking about, do you think it was okay that you guys got rid of those executive orders? And she responds, point blank, we did the right thing. Mm, okay. Are you <laughs> so and what was hilarious is trump was at a i don't know if it was hilarious but i was quite entertained by it because i get entertained by those sort of things trump was at a arizona rally last night and he was asked about this and his face of like he goes like he does like a, a head like nod a back <laughs> excuse me she she said that she actually said that was the right thing Mm -hmm. was really funny to me. She said during that town hall, she believes they've handled the border correctly. CNN pressed her on it. Would you have done anything different? Do you regret anything? And she said, quote, I think we did the right thing. Now, wait a minute, that she's handling correctly? Correct. She said that? She said that. She said, quote, I think we did the right thing. We allowed 21 million people in. We allowed 13,099 murderers. We allowed mental institutions from all over the world. If she said that, Look, she's a grossly incompetent person. And if she said that, they had the worst border in history. And what blows my mind is that, again, Cooper is giving her an opportunity to pull back on it, to correct it. Do you know what I mean? And she, she just does a knee-jerk reaction because, I don't know, is she too prideful? I have no I, idea. I can't figure her out. I thought it was just as simple as she has no original thoughts or ideas, and so that makes it difficult to answer questions because you don't know which way the wind is blowing, and that's usually what guides your decision is whatever you need for the day. <clears throat> I think it's a little more complex than that. I can't figure her out. 
quite yet. I don't think it's as simple as just she's very vapid and has no like foundational beliefs or values because this isn't just I can go either way at any time. This is like strategic failure. And I don't understand why she refuses to take the handout from these interviewers who are trying desperately to kind of hold her hand during and help these her. And, and help her because they see it. They're watching her fail in real time. <laughs> and she just doesn't even respond to them. I think doesn't, she's it's weird. I think she's just so dependent on her script and so mm -hmm. anxious to like not make a mistake and that she uses the script that she has in her head as a security blanket she's unable to deviate Do you know that's what, I mean? what i'm saying though then her staff really is the worst because if they know this about her and they have to <laughs> why wouldn't they prep her for these kinds of questions and give her a script well she took the day off <laughs> She took the day off to prepare. I mean, I don't know. And then the what another one, she there was just so many little golden nuggets because then she was also asked about the rising prices of groceries. And she and talked she, about price gouging again. She tried talked about price gouging again. And then she started talking about the her housing proposal. And then Cooper comes in. He's like, okay, cool. I get your idea about price gouging. This is literally how this went down. I get your idea about price gouging, but what are you going to do about grocery prices now? Like he's asking. He's like, mm -hmm. right now, grocery prices as a whole are too expensive. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about them now? And I kid you not, she repeated her price gouging plan and applied it specifically to what just happened with Helene as, you know, in Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, and Western North Carolina. Let me just ask you about price gouging. I looked at your plan. Uh, you talk about going after price gougers, and I'm quoting from the plan, on essential goods during emergencies or times of crisis. I get that. How does that help, though, someone like Eric with prices that for years the grocery price has just been high? Well, first of all, Anderson, as you know, and obviously CNN has been covering extensively uh, what has been happening in the state of Georgia, North Carolina, Florida. Mm -hmm. It's a real issue. I, I was attorney general of California. I was the top law enforcement officer of the biggest state in the country. I took this issue on because it affects a lot of people. And I'm not going to apologize for the fact that we need to actually deal with accountability when these, not all, in fact, most don't, but when companies are taking advantage of the desperation and the need of the American people. We saw it actually during the pandemic as well where because of supply chain issues, we, there was a, a reduction of supply and then they would inflate the price of everyday necessities. She didn't answer the question. Like she just repeated again, the same thing. Again, she, her staff is the worst or she is the worst possible presidential candidate because even candidates that I disagree with by every possible metric can still answer basic questions about their policy platform. She can do, she can't manage to even do that. Her staff has to know that and go, okay, listen, Kamala, they're going to ask you questions about inflation. This is what you say. So if they are doing that and she is responding like this, we're in trouble. Well, and here, this woman she, has a degree in economics. And who is on her economic team that she can't give a coherent response on how to deal with inflation? Right. Right. That's why I'm saying we're in trouble. She is an awful candidate. And I'm not saying that only because I don't want her elected because I'm a conservative. I'm saying it because, objectively speaking, everybody sees it. She is not good at this. And I can't tell if she's not good at it. Well, no, she's not good at it because she doesn't have. We can all see that. Yeah, she's not good at it because she's just not intelligent. I hate saying that. But also, I just don't think she cares that much. I don't think that she cares about what Americans are really going through. And that's what separates her from Donald Trump, because you can say a lot of things about Donald Trump. And I have in the past been very critical of him. I think he genuinely cares about Americans and what they're I think going so through. Too. I absolutely and think so, too. I feel that a lot of the time when I watch him. I w have not always been so charitable, but in the last four years, I've watched him and I do believe he has a heart for suffering Americans that are 
not being treated fairly, Americans that are having to suffer under really bad policies. And I just don't get that from her. No, I just see her. She, I mean, she'll say that she wasn't a career politician, but she has yes, been she in was. government in some form Come or on. another. She's trying to claim it because she hasn't been in D.C. her entire That's, career. It's bogus. She's a but, career politician. Absolutely. She's been I'm, in politics one way or another for the last 30 years. You're, absolutely. That's your career. And it's <laughs> funny because the whole thing, this whole, obviously, she gave wrong answers. And she also, first of all, let me mention before I get into this, two things I do want to give honorable mention to is that she was asked about eliminating the filibuster and she was also asked about expanding the court and course, she basically yes. said absolutely we should get rid yep. of the filibuster yep. and she said we should examine the court yeah As which means she's, I want to yeah bust and it wide open, open. And, it. and people do not get riled up enough about that I don't think I don't think enough people understand that if you eliminate the filibuster and if you expand the court that will transform the way our country operates fundamentally, fundamentally it, will, it will change how legislation works it will change it will be a mess it will be chaos and since those especially people don't even understand what the filibuster is they hear it. They're like, wait, what is that? Is that when someone stands up and like reads from a cookbook for seven hours? I don't get it. I mean, kind of yes, but no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's happened. It can happen. <laughs> um, you know, and and the Supreme Court feels far away and really like kind of lofty. And people really only hear about it when there's a scandal of some sort or infighting. But those institutions run the way they run and have for decades. And if you rip the rug out from under them and change them in such fundamental ways. I don't think people understand the implications of that. And so, I mean, they play fast and loose. Democrats are like, yeah, let's put 19 people on the court. Yeah, let's get rid of this filibuster. Let's let's it change the Constitution away. this way. It's, guys, you don't know what you're messing with here. It takes away it'll guardrails. Work. It will. And it will work poorly for you. OK, you want this now because you don't like how stuff is going down. But it will come back to bite you. Well, big that's, time. that's exactly what happened with the fil when they got rid of the filibuster in regards to uh, confirming Supreme Court judges. Yeah. Because that was Harry Reid that got rid of mm -hmm. that, which was a Democrat. McConnell mm -hmm. was like, you are going to regret that. For and he's like, that. and immediately you're going to regret it. <laughs> Feel the burn. And, and it was all because they wanted to get Obama judges on there. Yeah. And then. You had, oh my gosh, I forgot, Ruth Bader Ginsburg mm -hmm. hold on for dear life to her seat and then literally almost croak on the bench. That doesn't sound very kind, but that's pretty much what happened. And much now they're all upset. Chagrin. And they turned tail on Ruth, the RBG. Everybody loved her. She was queen, queen Ruth, the notorious RBG. And then she died when she did and she never retired. And all these Democrats, I have never... I would have never guessed that they all would have turned tail on her, but yeah, they, they did. They're like, oh, how dare she do this to us? Because like, if wow. she would have Such retired, loyalty. if she yeah. would have retired earlier, they would have maintained or at least right. had more of an even split on the court. So people just don't think these things through. But thank you for bringing that up because the filibuster and the Supreme Court are things that the Democrats are gunning for. And if they lose this election, oh my gosh, well, they're I mean, going to. Full court gonna, press on those things. It's going to be wild. It's going to be yep. insane. But speaking, the other thing I wanted to mention as we wrap up Harris's town hall was, I want to read this quote. Okay, this is a quote from Harris during the town hall <laughs> that Megan Kelly tweeted oh, out. It was, and she didn't even preface it or put anything else. She just put the quote in her tweet and it was just golden. You it don't need anything so good. else. Okay, this is, it goes, there's a lot that was done, but there's more to do. And I'm pointing out things that need to be done that haven't been done, but need to be done. Oh my gosh. It's, whew. Now, she said that in response to a question from Anderson Cooper as to like, why haven't you done any of these? Like you have all these proposals. Why didn't you do any of them while you were vice president? Yeah. And that was her answer. Okay classic word salad moment i mean it, really it was i just my mouth was okay when i heard i was like you have to be kidding me like this is your answer well and all of the media talking heads 
they could not pretend like that town hall went well. No. And they all expressed in the most gracious way possible <laughs> so as not to inflame and enrage the campaign that she just didn't do good. Well, and, and they were very clear. The best one, because it was a comment that I started seeing in headlines, like in quotes, was mm -hmm. David Axelrod, who yeah. is mm -hmm. a hard Democrat, like big yeah. D Democrat. OK. Yeah. And he lamented, essentially, in his analysis and said that was word salad city. When she doesn't want to answer a question, her habit is to kind of go to world word salad city. And she did that on a couple of answers. One was on Israel. Anderson asked a direct question. Would you be stronger on Israel than Trump? And uh, there was a seven minute answer, but not, none of it related to the question he was asking. The entire town hall, not just that quote. It was just it did not go well. And you even had Van Jones also acknowledge that he's annoyed with the word salad situation. Mm -hmm. I think that the word salad stuff gets on my nerves. I think that some of the evasions are not necessary. But when she's talking about trying to get you a house, I believe her. Mm -hmm. Immediately after, you had Jake Tapper point out that she didn't really answer any questions. You had Dana Bash immediately answer or say that not only does she not really answer any questions, but if this is her closing argument, it's not it did not stick. It did not land. Focused a lot more on Donald Trump, I think it's fair to say, than she did on uh, many specifics in terms of what she would do uh, as president. But she did go into uh, some of her plans for small businesses. Well, I'll just tell you what I'm hearing from people who I have been talking to, uh, and that is that uh, if her goal was to close the deal, they're not sure she did that. And, you know, some people have asked, is she being held to a different standard? Maybe. But that's maybe the world that she's living in. And on the question of who she is, people are understanding that a little bit more. But what she will do, the question about her legislative priorities, name one, there, there wasn't one. She did not do well. And that is a general consensus mm -hmm. of her performance at the town hall. I want them to stop saying, I want all of these people to just be honest and say it's not about her being a female and getting unfair treatment. It's not about her not having enough time in this campaign to prepare. It's not about it being difficult because she wants to be loyal to Joe Biden. I just need one of them to go, you know what? I perhaps campaigning and being a presidential candidate does not suit her. And perhaps they should have stuck with Joe Biden because they, at this point, I feel very confident saying that if they would have run Joe, they would have had a better chance of winning than with her. Believe it or not, I think I have to agree with you. And oh, I love it when we agree on this. <laughs> this is good. It was wild, actually, because The Hill put out an opinion piece. And I can't remember who wrote this opinion, but I, the headline was like ingrained in my, just seared in my head. And it was something like, Maybe they should have stuck with Joe. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, agree. I, I think that <laughs> at this point, I think they're also thinking that it's the like campaign. buyer's remorse. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's what you get for trying to thwart democracy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I think with at least with Joe Biden, people, he's a known commodity. People are comfortable with him and the people that might be on the fence. I think that they would have felt more comfortable like coming back around to Joe or just saying, you know what, at least with him, he's been a career politician. He might not, he's definitely not uh, fit to be president, but he'll surround himself with people who can kind of manage it like they have the last three years, yeah. basically run the presidency. With her, I think people are just not loving that option, which is why she did not have any supporters in 2019. Yeah, so she did not do well. The, the, the joy is officially, the we vibes, said this already. The vibes so, are gone. <laughs> they're so gone. Versus, there was another town hall. J.D. Vance did a town hall with Cuomo, of all people, in News Nation, which I think Cuomo I love is, that for him. I love that Cuomo, I mean, he's, let's not forget or forgive, but <laughs> Cuomo's coming around. I think he's having a little bit of a- Having a moment. Right? Like he's, he's what's the word? He's Republic conservative curious. I yeah. feel like he's <laughs> curious. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> yeah, I think so. So during the town hall, it was so good because first of all, JD Vance is a freaking rock star. Like he mm-hmm. legitimately, he answers questions, not only with the script or whatever, if you want to say that, because of course they all have their talking points, but he actually answers the question. He yeah. acknowledges it. You know what I mean? He's he, smart. He's studied. He knows what to say. He has actual ideas and he knows how to verbalize them. And well, quite and honestly, it, this isn't just a campaign for Donald Trump. He's running right now for 2028 oh, to yeah. be the president for sure. And I mean, initially, and he's killing I was, it. <laughs> so I was about to say, initially, I would have said I was skeptical about that. And now I'm yeah. going like, I was skeptical and I knew how strong of a candidate he was, or at least how strong he is when he self presents. Like he's able to take care of himself and answer questions. He's not going to flub an interview. I was initially put off by the whole, not put off, but I was like, dang it, with the cat lady comments. I'm like, this cannot drag him down. Come on, he's too good of a candidate. But the last two months, he's just surging because he is very good off script and on script. He's great. And I think once he was able to get out from behind the mainstream media filter, yeah, people were, it's like when he did, so he did that interview with Theo Vaughn, Mm -hmm. right? Which was freaking hilarious. Like Theo Vaughn is just like ripping with these jokes and stuff like that. J.D. Vance is getting his humor. He's laughing. Yeah, it's It's just like bro dude. He's just normal. He's normal and they tried to make him weird and they tried to make him kind of pervy and weird and like a fundy kind of and then you have tim walls who's like legitimately yeah. weird pervy and weird we haven't even talked much about tim maybe we'll do an extra episode on that but with jd he's just a good old boy like he's smart and he has good ideas you don't have to agree with everything but he's strong and he's kind of resolute and i think people are seeing that and going okay i want i want him in there because trump's only getting one term and i want him to have some experience because maybe we elect him in 20. Well, and what's really interesting is, which is a difference again between Trump and Harris, is that Trump has been in business. Trump has mentored people and put them into positions of leadership to head up a certain segment of his business or a hotel or some kind of development. He fosters and helps bring people up into positions to help them advance their career, right? Like he has to do that as a businessman because he has to delegate. That is not what you see from the Harris campaign or from institutional politicians in general. They're like crabs in a barrel where they're like dragging each other down to try and keep each or try to maintain their positions. And so I think that's also one of the reasons that she chose Walsh because he was weak and wouldn't upstage her. Yeah, versus, she's not threatened by him at all. Exactly. Versus Trump mm-hmm. is like hoping to have a legacy that continues. And he saw that in J.D. Vance. Yes, this will reflect kindly on him if he is able to lift up J.D. to where he wants him to go. Like it's basically he's setting himself up for what the history books are going to write because he knows that people aren't friendly necessarily to him. But if he can get in there and monetarily take care of the country bring about a more safe and secure feeling for a majority of Americans and then hand you a vice president who will make a killer president. Yeah. A really strong president. (laughs) We have maybe a couple, a decade or two of, I don't know, some kind of security. I think he knows how important that is. Like planning for the future. And to show like, what was funny is that to show like an example of their relationship during this town hall, Trump calls in (laughs) To ask a question, right? Because yeah. he and it was really funny. We'll play the clip for you guys in a minute, but just to give you the setup, Cuomo's like, we have a surprise guest or question or whatever. And JD Vance like sits down for it and it is Donald J. Trump on the phone, <laughs> on the phone. with a question. So Senator, you're gonna want to sit down for this one. Oh no. Not unlike Beetlejuice. <laughs> If you invoke the former president's names too many times in a row, he's going to want to weigh in on what is being said (laughs) about him. And we have a call right now from former President Donald John Trump. He wants to weigh in. (laughs) Mr. President, I know there's a little bit of a delay. Can you hear us? And what is your question for the senator? Well, I can hear you, Chris. And I do have a question, and I think it'll be quite an interesting one. The answer should be easy. How brilliant is Donald J. Trump? (laughs) 
take your time. Think uh, about it. Well, first of all, sir, this is supposed to be undecided voters. I would hope that I have your vote, of all people. But I, here, here's, first of all, sir, of course, you're very brilliant, and we, we both agree. We both agree that it's important to have very smart people running our government. But here's, here's the thing about President Trump that, aside of you, sir, if you'll forgive me um, for, for telling this story that I think often people don't see. And of course, I've got my beautiful wife here in the front row. And one of my favorite moments with President Trump is we were hosting an event for him at, near our home in Cincinnati a few months ago. And of course, you know, my wife was a little bit nervous to really you know, talk to the, 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 the president of the United States. And he asked her, what do you think about your husband being in public service? And she gives, if you know my wife, a very diplomatic answer. You know, sir, he really cares about the people of Ohio. He's thrilled to be able to serve them, and I'm happy to support him however I can. And President Trump chuckles and goes, yeah, my wife hates it, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing that it did is it just immediately broke the barrier. And it wasn't the former president. It was just a person talking to my wife. And I think you guys were able to have a nice conversation. But that ability to relate to anybody in any environment, I think that's the true brilliance of Donald J. Trump. I just thought that was really cute. It was funny. It showed humor between the two of them. He gave an, a legitimate answer. Like, G.D. Vance actually gave a really good answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Like, But it is also quintessential Trump to call in and ask yeah. his vice president, why is Donald J. Trump great? So <laughs> it is, but it also shows, like we talked about at the top of the episode, they're having fun. They're bros. They can banter back and forth. I don't know what it's like when the two of them are together and they're actually talking about serious things, but it seems to me they have a good rapport and Trump isn't threatened by J.D., even though, honestly, like, J.D. would be able to outsmart him probably on most a lot of issues <laughs> a lot, a lot of, of issues <laughs> whereas you have Kamala who would not pick someone like a Josh Shapiro even though he would have objectively been a better oh vice absolutely president because he's smarter than her he's a better candidate he's easier to listen to he has ideas even though I don't care for them he has policy positions that he can articulate she would never pick him she's threatened by him well and the end of Vance closed the town hall with a really amazing message of unity because mm -hmm. he was asked about that. And which is a very common question that they're getting in the town hall or that they have. Kenneth has gotten from during the town hall. Jeez, I can't speak. It's, <laughs> it's a very common question that has been around for this election, mm -hmm. especially after everything that we've been through for the last few years. Yeah. And he gave a really great inspiring response to unity. It's going to be a lot of our fellow Americans who didn't vote for us, but I think one leadership can really set the tone. And, you know, people forget this after the election of 2016. Donald Trump talked a lot about the importance of unity, about the importance of bringing our country back together. He talked a lot about how there were people in the Republican Party who wanted to, him to arrest Hillary Clinton. And Donald Trump said, no, it's time for us to heal as a country, actually re realize that we're on the same team. So I think the most important thing, ma'am, we just have to set the tone, right? We have to set the tone that we're all Americans, we're all in this together, and that we're all part of the same American family. But then I think also we all have responsibility here. I mean, you know, American citizenship is hard. You've got to be smart about the issues. You've got to know our history. You've got to pay attention and study to what's going on. We've got to be better at communicating and talking to one another. The, the biggest thing that I worry about, we're talking about threats to democracy. That's a term that you hear a lot. To me, the biggest threat to democracy is the rising tide of censorship. The idea that we should be trying to silence our fellow Americans rather than persuade them and talk to them. That's always gonna, gonna lead to people being pissed off because they don't like to be told what to think or what to say. They like to talk to one another. And that's one thing that I'll always commit to. I'll always try to talk to people. We'll go out there and we'll do events with people who disagree with us. We'll answer questions from people who don't always see eye to eye. But I think if we set the tone at the top, the leadership of this country is all about communicating with one another. I think that's how we start to heal the divide, but we all have a role in it. And, and one, one final point I'll, I'll say about this. If you're discarding a lifelong friendship because somebody votes for the other team, then you've made a terrible, terrible mistake and you should do something different. Like, don't, don't pass aside. Like most of my family, obviously, is gonna vote for, you know, Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, and if they, they, they're not, actually, I need to talk to them. 
Um, but but I've got friends who like me personally, acquaintances who aren't necessarily going to vote for me. That doesn't make them bad people. And you can't. We can't. This is my my most important advice. Whether you vote for me, whether you vote for 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 Donald Trump, whether you vote for Kamala Harris, don't cast aside family members and lifelong friendships. Politics is not worth it. And I think if we follow that principle. We'll heal the divide in this country. Thank you. Matt. Versus you have Harris, who is out here giving the Trump is Hitler talking point. This time, at least there were people around him who could control him. But do notice in this election, they're not with him this time. In fact, just this week, America heard from John Kelly, a retired four-star Marine general who was Trump's White House chief of staff, who said, that as president, Trump praised Hitler. Take a moment to think about what that means. That Trump said, quote, Hitler did some good things. And that Trump wished he had generals like Hitler's, who would be loyal to Trump and not to America's constitution. This is not 2016 and it is not 2020. I was watching Megyn Kelly and she mentioned, so she has Mark Halpern, Sean Spencer, and this dude named Dan, I can't remember his last name, but he's like the Democrat on the two-way show. And she mentioned how the Democrat Congressional Campaign Committee and also the Senatorial Campaign Committee have essentially put the message out to their down-ballot candidates that they don't have to follow Harris's lead and that they kind of can start distancing themselves from Harris because they're concerned that she's dragging the ticket down and they're going to not only lose the presidency, but then control the House and the Senate, which I think is wild. I think that for them to say something like that and kind of send out that message, they know she's going to lose. And they don't want to also, like you said, lose all of the constituents in those specific areas. They want to stay away from her. She's toxic in that regard. I don't think that there's a huge appetite amongst mainstream Democrats who don't pay tons of attention to politics but have always voted Democrat. I don't think that there's a huge appetite for this whole baby Hitler talking point. I don't think that they're comfortable well, with and it. And I think because they shouldn't be worn out by it in general. And I think it's yeah. also it's funny because I shared that on my stories and the consistent response that I got from people mm-hmm. on my Instagram. And of course, this is my own little bubble. But the consistent response that I got was like, he's already had a presidency. Yeah. Everybody he's, said that to me. Same. Yeah. If and he was he going was, to be this dictatorial monster, don't you think he would have done it by now? What do you think he was waiting, lying in wait? So maybe he'll get a second term but he lost, but he's coming back and he's going to just be even worse now. Like, I just don't think people are seeing that. Yeah, it it makes no sense. And so during, he was in Arizona yesterday in- I don't remember if he was was. Yeah, I don't remember if he was in Vegas or Reno, but he was in Arizona. And most of his speech and most of the rally was on immigration, obviously, because he was in Arizona. But- During while he was there, he was interviewed by Fox News and he was asked specifically to respond to the John Kelly statements. Right. Mm -hmm. What is your response? What do you think? In classic form, Trump calls him a bully, says he doesn't like him, doesn't fire him or whatever. Well, listen to what he had to say here. I want to give you a chance to respond to your former chief of staff, John Kelly, directly. He said some things about you, essentially accusing you of disparaging American soldiers in an Atlantic article. When's the last time you talked to him and how would you like to respond? Years ago, uh, I fired him. Uh, He was a bully. He was a bad guy. And he ended up being a weak guy because all bullies end up being weak. Uh, And he wasn't a smart guy. It's a bad combination. But uh, I fired him. He made a statement that I'm like Hitler, uh, it's, uh, just couldn't be further from the truth. It's just the opposite, actually. Classic response from Trump. Mm-hmm. They're really trying, as in, when I say they, you have Harris and some establishment. Now, what's interesting is that Obama hasn't jumped on this bandwagon. Like, he has not specifically said that 
Trump is Hitler or Trump is a fascist. Now he's no, definitely- because he is a good politician and knows that this is basically like a lethal blow to this gal's campaign. He doesn't want to be attached to that because this is I mean, let's be honest, he's kind of fading. He's older now. It's been some time since his presidency. The younger generation is coming up. Up. They don't necessarily feel as warm and fuzzy about Obama as, say, our generation did, because uh-huh. we remember him being elected vividly. So he knows that he doesn't have tons of more time in the spotlight in a very impactful way, in my opinion. And I don't think he wants to be attached to her if she loses and loses because of this. I mean, I just I think he is staying away from it because he understands it's a really dangerous and just bad talking point well and another what i mean he's smart Mm -hmm. harris not so smart but what i think is also interesting is that we have hillary clinton who is now jumping on now she's of course used this trump is going to be a dictator talking point for forever forever right she was the og with like she her hair has been on fire since 2016 right but she went on she was with caitlin collins on cnn Mm -hmm. and who also by the way has gotten really like angry and nasty as the years have gone on she used to be a little bit i don't know like cute little button kind yeah but now it's just like she's got the smirk and the eyebrows and she's mad the angry eyes. Yes. <laughs> Rachel's really obsessed with the angry eyes. I am. I'm big on, I am big on like nonverbal communication <laughs> and like body language. And Caitlin, I used to really enjoy watching her on CNN and now she just seems mad. Well, let me tell you, she Hillary was doing an interview with Caitlin Collins. And of course they bring up the subject of Trump and fascist Hitler or whatever. Mm-hmm. And Hillary Clinton pulls a James Carville. Okay, because we talked about this in a last episode, and she insinuates that Trump's Madison Square Garden rally, which is coming up, I believe, next week, mm-hmm. is a well, reenactment. It would have to be. It's the last week. I know, right? <laughs> Can you believe it? I don't, I have no idea what dimension I'm in, much less what day <laughs> I'm know. in. Right. But that this Madison Square Garden rally is going to be a reenactment of the Nazi rally in 1939. <sighs> And, you know, one other thing that you'll see next week, Caitlin, is Trump actually uh, reenacting uh, the Madison Square Garden rally in 1939. I write about this in my book. Uh, President Franklin Roosevelt was appalled that neo-Nazis, fascists in America, were lining up to essentially pledge their support for the kind of government that they were seeing in Germany. So I don't think we can ignore it. It's so exhausting. These, these, I mean, come on. It's so, it's like, get over yourself. Or get a new talking point. Why? Why are you trying to, nobody even listens when you say Trump's a racist anymore because that word means zero things. And do you honestly, are you really, thinking that <laughs> your last Trump's rally at Madison Square Garden that's not going to have all white people at it because hi by the way Trump's doing great with the latino vote he's doing great with black men he's doing great across the board with other nationalities or not nationalities i'm tired too <laughs> with other ethnicities besides white people are you really saying that his rally is going to just be a bunch of people in white hoods really well, is that and it's- what you're going to marry yourself to is this what we're gonna is this what we're going with the whole thing was hilarious to me too because you started to see i started to see a meme on x where it's like hitler drank water and then it's a picture of trump (laughs) drinking water and it's like stupid trump is hitler (laughs) yeah they can't make up their mind if they want to stick with it or if they don't i the new yorker yesterday put out a post on instagram and it didn't talk about Trump, but it was profiling Hitler and how he came to power because like now's the time. We're the same. (laughs) Yeah. Same. Um, And so because now Hitler's all the rage. Um, (laughs) And so they posted this on Instagram. I literally just took their post and put it in my stories like, oh, I see it's another Hitler day. Like we're going to talk about Hitler today because Donald Trump's baby Hitler made a pulled my story my stories down saying that 
It's dissemination. Yeah, I'm sending out violent and dangerous rhetoric. I'm like, it's a New Yorker piece. <laughs> they posted it. They're always, everybody's talking about how Trump is Hitler, but I can't post about how you're talking about how Trump is Hitler because that's dangerous. Or is it maybe you saying Trump is Hitler? That's it's what's wild. Dangerous. Well, and it's like the talking point that there I've um, been seeing in some of the articles of like, oh, by the way, Hitler was elected. Yeah. <laughs> and I, okay. <laughs> Yeah, Hitler under threat it. of death. Like, jeez, <laughs> people read a history book. It was, it's just, oh my gosh, it's wild to me. So that is what's been going on. Oh, oh, big news, big news. Not only, so today, oh, what is today? Today's Friday. Today's Friday. Oh, Tell them what's happening. Two things, very big. First of all, Trump is supposed to be recording with Rogan today, which now I'm, that is that is news that I am excited about. Trey he better, excited. They, that production team better turn that, podcast around real quick or is it immediately be, like they better get it out today this is I not i'm not waiting till monday <laughs> yeah and I they're not gonna release the turnaround around schedule is or anything well, it like better that. be quick okay <laughs> she's like i want it now i do <laughs> yes i want to know if it's gonna be three hours i think it's gonna break the internet it could be Who like knows? an hour and a half right i don't think I, trump's gonna sit with him for three hours but i don't know it's trump and I hope I mean, J.D. Vance calls in. That's what I hope. That would be so great. Wouldn't that be great? I think it'd be or he cute. pops in as a special guest or something yeah. like that. I think that would be, be really good. The other big news that everybody is very excited about, which apparently mm. maybe, possibly, I'm guessing this time is not a tease or a complete like psyop. It's been, like it it's was. been picked up by like every single major news network. Remember so I, I have a feeling. The DNC, yeah. it was like, oh, yeah. oh Taylor Swift floated. or Beyonce is going to show up. Yep. Well, Harris is going to be in Texas, in Houston, campaigning with, oh my gosh, who is it? I can never remember this dude's name. He's challenging Tom Cruise. Not Tom Cruise! <laughs> Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz. I have it. I have it here somewhere. I just wrote about him last um, night. Dang it. I, I can't know. remember his name. All Red. All Red? Is that right? No, last that's Gloria All Red. Oh, oh gosh. No. Anyways, some dude, <laughs> some Democrat that we cannot remember. We don't like either of those we people. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fine. Yeah, I remember. But the race is close in Texas. And so Harris is going to be down there campaigning with that dude that I cannot remember the name of Gloria right now. Allred. <laughs> <laughs> and Beyonce is going to be there. Okay. And the Bay, the say, bay Hive. It's so funny to me that so far we've had, we had Eminem in, in Detroit. Mm -hmm. She was recently... Lizzo. Lizzo, um, Megan the Stallion. Yeah, and then who's this guy? Oh my gosh, Bruce Springsteen was just campaigning <laughs> oh, with her. Oh yeah, it's and now well, she and... has Beyonce. Well, okay. What I want to know, I need the actual deets because Lizzo charged her or the campaign or whoever pays the bills, like two point three million dollars for an appearance for so whatever they, that she was. doesn't even want to just support her she's like no that's what i'm gotta... saying I, I posted that in my stories i was like how must it feel that people don't even want to support you that they're charging you for their friendship so i want to know how much beyonce is charging that's what i want to know i think that's, that's an interesting be a pretty question penny. yeah yeah I know. well and, I and the thing is that when you're dealing with camp you know, like i did sponsorship stuff for a long time when I was food blogging mm -hmm. and I would have to disclose that I don't know Pompeian olive oil paid me no we talked about that in the last episode they don't or we talked about maybe with Blake you don't have to disclose certain things like these people who get paid to put up stories and posts for the Harris campaign they do not have to disclose that according to Meta rules but I have to disclose if I'm working with an uh, organization on a campaign, not it's wild a presidential campaign, but an actual campaign to get out information about whatever the organization is doing. So, no, the disclosure rules are totally different and it's completely unfair and really like secretive and shady. I don't like it. And I think it's really funny before, you know, we're I'm going to start wrapping us up. But, you know, Harris is out here with this talking point sometimes of like, and if you watch his rallies, people start to leave because they're exhausted and mm -hmm. he's like nonsense and they can't deal with it and did it all this kind of claim and i'm like this man does not require bruce springsteen or beyonce or eminem yeah. to be at his rallies in order for right. people to show up right there's not like 20 minutes of twerking first from a like celebrity he just comes out and talks to people okay oh, so gosh that's totally different but yay to i don't know beyonce yeah so 
to wrap us up, I do want to mention that I think we're going to be doing another unfiltered episode specifically on these little scandals, these attempts at October surprises that are popping up, specifically on Doug Emhoff, which is the second gentleman. I hate saying that, but yeah, that's who he is. But he is. <laughs> and then also there is now allegedly, there's some alleged groping incident that happened in the 90s with Trump. Conveniently, yeah. now I will say that the Emhoff story has been around, well, like it's been around for probably two months. Because remember, mm -hmm. there was like the nanny situation too. Yeah. They just don't talk about it in the medium. But exactly. It's mm -hmm. As opposed to this one with Trump literally just showed up yesterday. Yeah. So we need to talk about the Doug Emhoff one because the media will not do their jobs and actually talk about that. I saw a guy, I think it's Scott Jennings on CNN. He brought it up on a panel and they all their heads exploded all went nuts they shut that guy down so fast started yelling at him cut to commercial break abby phillips is like nope we're not doing it and so it needs to get talked about it's relevant it's a big deal and i actually think maybe in our next unfiltered when we talk about doug and this new gal who said that donald trump groped her and who decided to remember Epstein. yeah decided to remember 10 days before an election about that anyways i think we should also maybe kind of go over what's been said about Tim Walls, even if we don't feel like the information is credible, but about- Yeah, I think that's fair because I've gotten that know, question too. So Me too, I'm getting it a lot. So we'll try and- We'll do a scandal. We'll bring the receipts <laughs> or whatever receipts we have. <laughs> scandal episode on Monday. So um, yeah. stay tuned for that. And I'm going to wrap us up for the weekend. Hopefully we will come out the other end alive and well. <laughs> I mean, I Monday. hope so. And make sure, you guys, I was going to, I wanted to remind everybody, Mercedes and I are putting out on our individual sub stacks resources for you in this last home stretch before the election. I know Mercedes put out a piece last night about- Not yet. I'm putting it together. You're putting it together? Okay. Yeah. So I about, have lies, the common lies yeah. that we're getting specifically on Trump. And then yep. also I did one on the his, like the actual background of what Harris- actually believes said, yeah 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 so definitely you're gonna want to check out those and i've put out some like a voter guide about the down ballot races and some information about what's what is the filibuster and different questions like that so make sure you guys are checking our sub stack we're trying to do our level best to get you the information you're asking for <laughs> in all of our spare time and those resources are not behind a paywall but if you want to support us you can check out a link in the show notes where you can get 50% off both of our sub stacks. So it's basically two for the price of one and you can support both of us in that, but you don't have to subscribe to both of us, but you have that option. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's it. I think we're going to wrap us up. We'll see you on Monday for our scandal episode. <laughs> in the meantime, hold on to your pantalones. <laughs> my, when my daughter listened to the podcast yesterday, she really appreciated that you said pantalones. <laughs> so I think that needs to be the new catchphrase. Well, and it's like, actually, it's a skit between my sister and I, because we're Puerto Rican. We are both bilingual. We're fluent in Spanish. But as a joke between the to two of us, we'll do Spanish with a really bad English accent, <laughs> which is perfect. And actually, I love that you're fluent in Spanish, but you don't, when you say Spanish words, you don't all of a sudden go from speaking totally normal English to then having a Spanish accent, but just for that one word, how like all of us gringos, like when we <laughs> are talking and then it was like for a while, remember when Sotomayor was, she was put on the Supreme Court and like every white person in media was like, yes, today we're going to be covering Sonia Sotomayor. <laughs> no, you just say your name normal because you're not Spanish and you don't speak the language. So I didn't even know you spoke fluent. I didn't moments where I will, depending on words, because there's some words that I do it just because they just sound so weird in my brain to like not like pantalones. <laughs> <laughs> but I try not to because I also find it kind of pretentious. And also I came up in the food industry and yeah, there was like, who is that bobblehead chef that she would speak Italian? Oh, oh yes. She was she had, yes, I know exactly. Oh, Del Giotta. 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 Del Giotta. yes. Yes. And I was like, she, went, she talked totally normal. And then all of a sudden, she, Italian. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Okay. Totally. Sorry, okay. guys. We Anyways, just, we that was just a random. Yeah. We're tired. Okay. So we we're going to wrap us up. 
for today's episode of Campaign Games. Make sure that you're following us, that you share it with a friend, you give us a five-star rating, just some general love. It really helps for the podcast to grow. Remember, as I said, the discount code is in the show notes along with a document with links to everything that we referenced today. And yeah, hold on. We'll see. We'll get you through this and we will see you on Monday with a scandal. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in and next time on Campaign Games, the game of survival for both the candidates and the voters. Catch you on Monday. Bye. Bye.